Welcome to our seventh Cornerstone Connection lesson. Glad to be here. On our panel today, we have um, Elsie, Misati, and Jabari together with our teachers, Chamona Lisa and Cha Eugene. On the instruments, we have Amy on the violin and Sid on the piano. I am Valerie Precious. I'll be taking you through the mission. Before we start, let us pray. Oh God, we thank you for this day. Thank you for being with us this far. Now as we're about to start, may your spirit guide us, be with us. In Jesus' name I pray and believe. Amen. So our title for today will be Scared of the Night. Mother called out to little five-year-old Adama in their home in the African country of Guinea. It's time to go to bed, she said. Adama didn't want to go to bed. No, she said, looking up at mother. I don't want to go to bed. Mother didn't look happy. Come on, Adama, she pleaded. It's time to go to bed. No, Adama said, I don't want to go to bed. Now mother was angry. Go to bed, she demanded. But Adama still didn't want to go to bed. Fear showed on her face. She began to cry. No, she whimpered. I don't want to go to bed. Adama didn't want to go to bed because she was scared. She was scared of the night. Every night for the past week, she had had the same bad dream at night. She couldn't remember the dream when she woke up, but she always woke up screaming and crying. Now Adama looked at her mother's stern face, and so there's no point in arguing with her anymore. She had to obey. With great reluctance, she slowly made her way to bed, but she was too scared to sleep. She tossed and turned for what seemed like a long time. Finally, she fell asleep. Then, in the dark of night, she woke up, screaming and crying. Mommy, come here, she shrieked. Help me. Two years passed. Every night, it was the same. Adama grew weak and sick from a lack of sleep. She was scared of the night. She didn't know what to do. Mother didn't know what to do. Then auntie heard about Adama. She lived far away in the big city of Conakry, the capital of Guinea. Auntie had an idea. Let me take the child to the Seventh-day Adventist church, she told Adama's mother. The pastor can pray for her. Mother was not a Christian. Adama was not a Christian. Auntie also had not been a Christian at one time, but she had been ter terribly sick, and an Adventist missionary had prayed for her. Jesus healed her, and she had given her heart to him. Now she lives next door to the Adventist church. Mother agreed to allow auntie to take the girl. Adama packed her small bag and went with auntie to Conakry. The pastor looked kindly at Adama as auntie told him the story. He was sad that the little girl hadn't been able to sleep for two years. He asked all the church members to pray for Adama. If these are demonic attacks, we will ask in the name of Jesus that the attacks stop, he said. That night, the pastor and the other church members prayed for Adama. That night, Adama slept soundly. She didn't have any bad dreams. She was so happy when she woke up in the morning. Jesus heard her prayers. For the first time in two years, she had slept the whole night. A year has passed since Adama had had her last bad dream. She's now eight and is no longer scared of the night. She lives with auntie next to the Adventist church and now studies at an Adventist school. I am no longer afraid, she says. I am living a good life. Jesus has answered our prayers. Part of the 13th Sabbath offering three years ago helped add new classrooms to a Seventh-day Adventist school in Conakry, Guinea. So many, so many children, like Adama, can learn about Jesus, who answers prayers and takes away bad dreams.
Grace and peace to you from wherever you are. This is Cornerstone Connections, and today we're looking at Lesson 7, titled Giant Faith, the famous story of David and Goliath. To begin, I'd like to introduce my panel. The very far right, we have Mona Lisa. And next to me, on my right, we have Jabari. On my left, we have Misati. And at the very end, we have Elsie Dama. And she will be taking us through the key text and the what do you think section. We'll see. Um, for the what do you, I'm sorry, for the key text, we'll be reading from 1 Samuel chapter 17, verse 45. And it says that David said to the Philistine, you come against me with sword and spear and javelin, but I come against you in the name of the Lord Almighty, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. Now we'll straightly um, we'll straight go on to the what do you think section. So if you took a test that measured how much faith you have in God, what grade do you think you deserve? <laughs> yes, start with Mona Lisa. Um, thank you. I think I'd be a B because I believe my faith is still childlike and mature. Thank you. Jabari? Uh, personally, I think I'd say C, because sometimes, well, you know, there are things you can't necessarily control, but again, what much does it mean if you don't care too much? Yeah, so even if I'm not necessarily believing in, or rather, trusting in God over that thing, if I don't care too much, it just, well, I just let it pass. So it's kind of like a 50-50 thing where I'm not worried, but not because I have faith in God, but maybe just because I don't care. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Surgeon? Yeah, I would really love an A on my scorecard, but um, I think I, I would give myself a C. And the reason why is sometimes, especially during tough times, it's very hard to believe in God and in his promises. I remember the story of the man who wanted his son to be healed. He said, I believe, but help my unbelief. So I'd give myself a C. Is that it? So looking at it, I'd, I'd give myself a B on that. Like me and A, something I'd, I'd desire to do all, to do all of that at, at A. But then for real, if I were to be objective, it's like I'd give it a B just looking at recent events. If I just blot out a year ago, I'd just say recent, recent, I give it a B. B. Yeah. I think if, if, if they could have provided like more grading, I'd give myself like a B minus, a C plus, like in between B and C. It's a journey, it's confusing. Like, I don't know. Sometimes it's good, sometimes it's weh. Just wah. It's a journey. All right, if your friends graded the test, what grade do you think they would give you? Yeah, so when my friends graded the test, I suspect that, oh, my, like the friends I'm, I'm hand selecting, they would be the ones who'd give me an A, because the thing is, I, you see that aspect when the adjacent people say you fake it till you make it, that sort of stuff. The thing is, I say things, very positive things, until I believe them. So that's the point. I'm going to say them until I believe them. So I think generally, because people will judge from what they see or what they hear, from what they see and they hear, they, they give an A. Yeah. Trajan? I would say the same. Um, I, I, <laughs> I appear to have a lot of faith. Uh, it's not always the case. But I think from their judgment, they would probably give me an A. Jabari? Mm. Well, maybe, maybe a B. Not, okay, because sometimes, like, I'm using my 
friends in school, as an example, yeah? Sometimes you have a test, and usually sometimes I'm not the only one who's rushing back and forth with books. Like, sometimes it just reaches a point where I've just sat down, yeah? So maybe I think either this guy has read, or number two, he doesn't care, or that he trusts himself at God. So maybe a B, but if they see a different reason as to why I'd just be sitting there, they'd probably give me maybe a C. Okay, Mona Lisa. Uh, thank you for the question. Um, for me, I believe it depends because I have layers of friends. Um, if you were to ask my mom, she'd give me an A. Um, because I, I, I love to come off as the one with the strongest faith so that she doesn't give up. Um, if you were to ask um, my friend, my friends or people my age, they'll give me, uh, like Elsie said, probably a B plus thereabout, because I don't share much of what's happening in my life. But if you were to ask, um, the person that I often go to when I'm struggling. Oh, man, I think they'd give me a D. Because they are the people who see me when I'm, I'm crying, I'm down, I'm feeling defeated. So I think them, they'll give me a D. Wow. OK. OK. Now I think about it, I also have layers of friends. And I think my friends in school would give me an A because they think when you go to church on Saturday, Aki, Aki, what? You spend a whole day in church. What are you doing? Like, ah, you guys going to heaven. I don't even know what you're still doing here. But if I pick my friends from church, especially my close friends, they might give me a B. Friends from home would obviously give me an A because they don't understand what I'm doing in church a whole day. Maybe my family would start giving me C's and D's and spreading my scorecard. But that's about it. And then for the last part, supposed to rank the following Bible stories in order from the person who demonstrated the greatest faith to the one who showed the very least faith. So to, to make this easier, I will ask each of you to give me your, your number one and your number ten. So from Jamona. Uh, thank you. This was a hard one to pick. But I... On the first number, I picked Daniel in the lion's den because that was literally death waiting to happen. You know, being thrown in the lion's den, you don't know what to expect, and faith is kind of shaky. And for him to walk into that den believing God will, you know, get him out of it, to me, that's number one, knowing there is a 99% chances I'm going to die here, but I'm still going to walk in there because that 1% of God is enough to hold the, the lions accountable. And at number 10, I'll pick the father of faith, Abraham, uh, sacrificing his son, Isaac, because he'd walked with God. So he had a lot of situations where faith worked for him. So him going to sacrifice Isaac, he had a huge percentage that God will come through. If he was able to keep that promise of giving me a son and providing my needs, then even this one he'll come through. So he already had that experience, so I'll put him at a 10. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Jabari? Um, the one who shows the most faith, I think I'd say Abraham offering his son Isaac as a sacrifice, because number one, Isaac was Abraham's first son, right? Which he really waited for. Oh, Right, he had Ishmael, yeah, so yeah. second. Oh, okay, so, well, yeah, his second son, he clearly doesn't have too many children, because how many were there? Two. Uh, two, yeah. right? And then it's also the same God who 
doesn't want you to kill. So, yeah, that's why Abraham would be number one. Then for number 10, the least faith. I think I'd say Peter walking on water because Christ's telling him to walk on water and he's right in front of him. Like Christ is right there telling him to walk and he's still doubting. He's right there. So, yeah, that's why I'd say Peter. Uh, for me, I would say uh, the person with the most faith was Rahab because she never saw any of the wonders of God being in Jericho. She only heard stories and she believed them even more than the people who saw them. So I think that was just, that's a lot of faith. I think faith is when you can't see and you still believe. And then the person with the least faith, I would say, I would say Esther. I mean, she's the queen. So going to see your husband shouldn't be that hard. I don't know. <laughs> I'm just saying. But I think Esther would be the least for me. So for myself, I'm looking at Noah. This guy had a lot of faith. Because 120 years is a long time. Like God shows up and is like, you, my guy, are, are the holy one. You and only you are holy. So let's do this. Build a huge ark that will accommodate every animal on this earth. Other than fish, I think. Other than fish. It'll accommodate every, every animal other than fish. Now, you're going to do this, 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 and the other. Then he says, I will bring rain. I think for us guys, we're used to rain. We're used to like seeing moisture come from down, come down and hit us on the head. But now I think, imagine like if you saw water rise. Like we're used to rain. Now imagine if God says tomorrow morning with your own eyes, you will see water levitate from the seas and the lakes and go and water there. I think that would look like crazy. Like someone goes on news today night and is like, tomorrow morning at dawn. Water shall levitate from the depths and shall water the plants. I think, of course, you think someone is perfectly crazy. You know, and then just imagine that someone says that for 120 years. That water will levitate from the deep. So water shall come from down and come onto the earth. I mean, that, that looks like a law of faith to me. Like even holding on to that fact of like it's so long. Ish. Then... On the other end, I'd look at the person with the least faith as Moses. Like, for me, Moses, it doesn't seem like a law of faith, so to speak, leading them through the Red Sea. Because this was a man who chucked his rod and it became a snake. And he was yeah. told, grab that slippery, slippery thing and it became a rod. And he'd grab it and it became a rod. There was a man who put his hand in his coat and his hand became leprous. That's literally rotting before his eyes. And then he put it back and like, boom, my hand is great. So I think it was maybe like baby, like for me, like the Red Sea looks like baby steps. So he's like, yo, lift that stuff and we. I mean, it feels, feels like baby steps considering his past. Thank you, guys. For me, the person with the least faith was Peter because Peter had seen many other wonders that Jesus had done. And I don't even feel like he showed any faith because he didn't even believe at first. He was thinking at first, so he didn't even show faith. So I don't even think he should be here, but give him a benefit of doubt, maybe, maybe he had faith. This wasn't enough. So for me, he didn't show at all. Like, even if you were, even if you were to drown, this is that you just pull him down with you if, if he was to drown, yes? But he did not. He was supposed to think of the things that Jesus had done before and that should have given him confidence to be like, I, he can't let me go down. He can't, he just can't. And for me, the person who showed the most faith was Noah and the ark, because you've never seen rain. You don't even know how it's supposed to happen. Is it supposed to start when the sun is shining or when, when there are clouds? Or is it supposed to be there when, I don't know. Like, he had no idea, and the moment he heard that God had told him it would rain, he believed, which, it's like, I don't know, it's like being told, the sun will be coming down, it stays here for a moment, then comes back up, and you're supposed to believe that as a person. Like in this day and age, with all the space um, research that has been done, that can never happen. How can the sun come in the middle of the atmosphere, then go back? It was that bizarre, like, what is rain? Why is it there? 
why is it falling? See, we have deal. Why is it? Why is that? But Noah still believed that. And for 120 years, eh, that's patience. That's a lot of patience. Back to you, Eugene. Right. Um, you know how they give awards and there's always an honorable mention. I think we, we can do one for Naaman. I mean, um, being told to dip seven times in the Jordan River for your skin to be healed. It's not even a clean river. It's not a clean river at all. It's one of the dirtiest rivers. Something wonderful about Naaman's story is it shows us that sometimes yielding to the Spirit does not yield instant rewards. I mean, he had to obey seven times. Seven acts of obedience led to a miracle, right? So some would have given up on the third dip, right? Yeah. And we love it, love it when the children sing that song. Yeah. But there's a, there's, a, there's a story there, like God will test you with small obedience, and then eventually he'll give you the big one. So now we go into the story. Jabari, would you mind? Okay, so into the story. The Lord said to Samuel, how long will you mourn for Saul, since I have rejected him as king over Israel? Fill your horn with oil and be on your way. I am sending you to Jesse of Bethlehem. I have chosen one of his sons to be king. Samuel did what the Lord said. Then he consecrated Jesse and his sons and invited them to the sacrifice. When they arrived, Samuel saw Eliab and thought, surely the Lord's anointed stands here before the Lord. But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not consider his appearance or his height, for I have rejected him. The Lord does not look at the things people look at. People look at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Jesse had seven of his sons pass before Samuel, but Samuel said to him, The Lord has not chosen these. So he asked Jesse, Are these all the sons you have? There is still the youngest, Jesse answered. He's tending the sheep. Samuel said, send for him. We will not sit down until he arrives. So he sent for him and had him brought in. He was glowing with health and had a fine appearance and handsome features. Then the Lord said, rise and anoint him. This is the one. So Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the presence of his brothers. And from that day on the spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon David. Then David took his staff in his hand, chose five smooth stones from the stream, put them in the pouch of his shepherd's bag, and with his sling in his hand, approached Goliath, the Philistine. David said to the Philistine, You come against me with a sword and spear and javelin, but I come against you in the name of the Lord Almighty, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This day the Lord will deliver you into my hands, and I'll strike you down and cut off your head. As the Philistine moved closer to attack him, David ran quickly toward the battle line to meet him. Reaching into his bag and taking out a stone, he slung it and struck the Philistine on the forehead. The stone sank into his forehead, and he fell face down on the ground. Well, so... The things this story teaches us about a few things. So, competition. Would Misati, would you like to answer that? Yeah. So, the way I see this story right here is, if we like take the huge scope, it's actually showing like sort of two events, particularly. But I'd like to focus in between. So, what happens is Eliab is the oldest son. Then Samuel is like, ah, God, this is the one. Then God says no. So Samuel has to give Eliab the L. Like, no. God has said no. And he's like, what, what don't I have? You know, as he's like, what don't I have? I look dashing, I look whatever. Then now his youngest brother is the one who's given the, the mantle. He's like, ah, yeah. God, what are these? Then before Samuel actually goes to smite Goliath, he shows up in the camp. And Eliab is like, so you're just here for the cinema. You're just here for the show. What are you doing here? You go and stay with those few sheep in the wilderness. That is. And I think Eliab was act. He was like, man, how can this little boy be the king while I'm here? You expect me to bow to this midget, so to speak. Young man, small boy. 
Like that, that sort of thing. I think that, that, that sort of competition may have made his heart pretty bitter for him to lash out at, <laughs> at David like that. I think it's sad. It's really, really sad. Mm. Um, God says in the book of 1 Corinthians that he has chosen the foolish things to put to shame the wise, and he has chosen the weak things to put to shame the mighty. So whenever you have a weakness in your life, it is actually an advantage because God loves to be at a disadvantage. He likes to select people who are weak so he can get more glory. And it is interesting in the story that even a man of God like Samuel can be deceived by looks. A prophet of God can be deceived by looks. Like he showed up to Jesse's house and he's like, this is the guy. He didn't even think it through. All right, so we need to be careful about looks. Looks can be deceiving. And then secondly, he says something so powerful. God says something powerful. The Lord does not look at the things people look at. All right? People look at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. So um, that means that we are being seen or viewed by two people primarily. There's people and there's God. Even though it is true that God looks at the heart, I want to say that it's also important to know that people look on the outward. So for you guys, when you go for job interviews and you know, you're applying for something, remember that people look at the outward appearance. You know, you, life is very competitive. I mean, I heard about a job that was being uh, advertised a few months ago and 2,000 people showed up. So for you to stand out, in the competition of life. Yes, you can have a good heart, but you also have to have a good suit if you're going to get employment. So we should not um, sideline outward appearance. But another way competition arises is Saul later on envies David, right? When the women start singing, and you know, I don't know you guys, if you remember sports games, the game was dull till the girls showed up, isn't it? When they were in the stands, guys started doing like tricks you never thought they could do, <laughs> right? So after the battle, when the women showed up and started saying, you know, Saul has killed his thousands, he was happy for a moment, and then he had David has killed his 10,000. So he got a bit envious. He felt some type of way. And um, competition comes even later in life. They say high school never ends. So now he's trying to be a king. And um, the king who is currently on the throne hates him and is trying to do everything to make sure he doesn't become king. And you should expect that. Sometimes God will put you under people who don't like you and still expect you to submit. And the lesson we can draw from this is exaltation comes from the Lord. You know, when a man's ways please the Lord, he makes even his enemies to be at peace with him. So you can expect that as well. If you're going through life, sometimes you'll be required to submit to people you don't even like. But God is testing you. God put David under Saul because of the Saul in David. And there's a Saul in each of us that we can only overcome through um, submission. Okay. So for the next question... Uh what does this story teach us about purpose in life, Mona Lisa, teacher Mona Lisa? Um, thank you for the question. Um, one thing that is clear in the Bible is our life is already predestined by God. The Bible says God knows our beginning to our end. And in Jeremiah, he says, before I formed you in your mother's womb, I knew you. And even in Jeremiah's case, we see he was anointed by God to be a prophet over his people before he was even born. That shows God already predestined how Jeremiah's life was going to you know, materialize. And from the story again, um, you see someone like David was born to lead. He's out there attending to his father's ship, you know. And one thing 
uh, I, I believe is predominant in the Bible is those who stuck by God and remained obedient to his course, they lived out their purpose, that purpose that they were, they were called to. And as human beings, we, we go through life looking for our purpose in life. That's something that we all yearn for. That's something that we all wish we could have. And Job says, uh, Job says in the book of Job 22, 21, agree with God and be at peace. Thereby God uh, will come to you. And Jeremiah 29 says, for I know the plans I have for you, plans for prosperity and no despair. And the psalmist in Psalm 57 too says, I cry out to God most high, to God who fulfills his purpose for me. So until you've met God, you can't figure out your purpose. Until you've met God, you can't live that purpose. So for you to get your purpose and live it, you have to meet God first. Thank wow. you. Mm -hmm. So talents and spiritual gifts. What does this story teach us about talents and spiritual gifts? Uh, Elsie. Okay, I, I don't know if this is a talent or a spiritual gift, correct me if possible. But you know that those people who they believe, Mpaka, they make you believe. Somewhere you are in this situation where you feel like Aki, there's no hope. But then there's this person who is with you, who, Anamini, she's so positive, she's so pes and not pessimistic, optimistic. She's very. Yes, we can do this, we can do this. Paka, she makes you the person who you are just crying, you are just on the floor, you, you don't know what to do. Paka, she makes you believe that you guys have got this. And there are those people who always bring things together or bring groups together towards a common goal. Same thing with David here. David, number one, he is a shepherd. Number two, he's not a titol, a tiakona muscles. He has none of that. Three, he's not even had any training, any military training. You can say a TD went to this boot camp somewhere for six months and know he can fight. He had, by, by the judgment then, he was unsuitable, unsuitable, unsuitable. Like even the lowest person in that military, I don't know, parade could not do what he wanted to do. Yet he's there, and he's over there saying, I can bring this guy down. So he goes there and he tells them that, you might come to me with sword and, and spear and javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord. And he actually, he killed, he killed, he killed Goliath, even though people thought he never could. So I don't know if it's a talent or a spiritual gift, but there's that person, I know you can think of that person who's always, I mean, not here, what's with the pessimistic thing? <laughs> optimistic. Who's always optimistic, who yeah. always thinks that these things are possible and they influence other people to believe the same thing. And I feel like you should strive to be that person. Even though, I don't know, in school, things don't seem like they'll, they'll pick up. Just be that person who always has something positive to say. To always bring that other person up because you never know how low someone is. So if you're over there, people is, are low and you're also being low, you're pulling everyone down. It's better you pull people up. You never know what you can do to someone. And I know people joke about it a lot in school. Like, we are, you get into an exam room with no content, and you're like, oh, you come to me with, with pipettes and test tubes and all these things, but I come to you in the name of the Lord. Do not use that. Like, you need to work. Sorry. You need to work so that God can also That's help right. you. Like, it, it takes human effort and divine intervention for things to work. So don't that you go there with no content whatsoever, but you're saying, you know, God will help me. He will not help you. But don't use that against him. He will not help you, but you need to work so that he helps you to, to achieve your main goal. Thank you. Okay, lastly, what does this story teach us about faith in God, Teacher UG? Um, Thank you. Um, let me just segue from what Elsie has said. It's a balance before we get to fear. It's a balance of talents and spiritual gifts. Um, David had talents. 
but they were nothing until the Spirit came upon him. And uh, for, for us, it's the same. We may have many talents and many things we are able to do, but they don't have power until God comes into our lives. One of my favorite texts in the Bible is Zechariah 4, where God tells Zerubbabel, not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit. So you can be intelligent, you can be a great singer, but without the Holy Spirit, there is no spiritual power. We also see that we should not, we should not think that just because someone else can do it, we can. One of my favorite examples of this is uh, um, the Red Sea was a way for the Israelites, but it was a trap for Pharaoh. People will see you do things and think they can do it as well and get, you know, get swallowed up by the waters. And we see that that was the temptation that David was given. Before he went to fight, he was offered Saul's armor, isn't it? And uh, let me just ask you guys, if he did take the armor and won, who would have gotten the glory? Saul. Saul would have said, you won because of, because of my armor. So we should be careful to know ourselves, to know our lane of grace and our gifts, and to stick to that lane. And then on uh, the, the issue of faith in God, I would like to approach it from a different perspective. Um, fear is the opposite of faith. And faith in God is, um, is a spiritual gift. One of the gifts of the Holy Spirit, actually, is, is faith. So we, we get faith from God. Faith is not something innate. And then secondly, fear, the opposite of faith, is faith in the devil. It is faith. It is negative faith. And just like Elsie told us, faith is contagious, but so is fear. Nothing spreads like fear. I don't know if you've ever been in a place and you saw people running and you, you, just, like, you just started running. You didn't understand why you were running. That's because fear is contagious. And we are also told that fear is a spirit. We've not been given the spirit of fear, but of power, of love, and a sound mind. So whenever you feel fearful, you can rest assured it is not of God. And then finally, to close out the story, um, there's an element that Misati brought out. David was viewed as a young person, a youth. And sometimes you can be, uh, there's, there's prejudice that comes with age. All right? People may think you're too young to have a position, too young to do this, too young to do that. And Timothy is told by Paul, let no one despise your youth. And I think you should take that away as well. As you go through life, God may bless you with position and power. God may bless you with gifts and privileges. Don't let anyone tell you you're too young to handle them. If God gave it to you, he gives you the ability to handle them. And in one of the punchlines, uh, Proverbs 3, verse 5 and 6, it reads the following, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways submit to him and he will make your paths straight. God only comes into our lives when we acknowledge him in all our ways and trust him with all our heart. So it is important for us to not have a half-hearted approach to the things of God, but to be fully, fully in his hand. That is when he intervenes in our lives. I don't know if there's anything anyone would like to add before we move on to Patrick's and Prophet's. Okay, so, Misati, go ahead. So our Patrick's and Prophets, our snippet for this week, is David, in the beauty and vigor of his young manhood, was preparing to take a high position with the noblest of the earth. His talents as precious gifts from God were employed to extol the glory of the divine giver, the love that moved him, the sorrows that beset him, the triumphs that attended him, were all things for his active thought. And as he beheld the love of God, in all the providences of his life, his heart throbbed with more fervent adoration and gratitude. His voice rang out in a richer melody. His heart was swept with more exultant joy. And the shepherd boy proceeded from strength to strength, from knowledge to knowledge, for the spirit of the Lord was upon him. Amen. Amen. So um, just a thought from Monday as we close personalize the key text to carry with you as a promise this week when you battle temptation. 
Yes, there was a war between David and Goliath, but the war, the real war of the Christian is a very spiritual war, and it's a war against temptation. And this is kind of similar to what Elsie had alluded to. You come to me with pipettes and, and burettes. Right here, so here the lesson writer writes, Satan, you come to me through pornographic internet sites, but I come to you in the name of the Lord Almighty, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This battle belongs to the Lord. And that's wonderful. Just one um, nugget I would give you is that spiritual warfare is not really about learning war, but it's about learning how to submit. That's why in Ephesians 6, we're told to stand strong in the Lord. We need to see Christ as our Savior, yes, but also as our Lord. Because only in submission do you get power from your king. But when you're out of line, you won't get supplies. So spiritual warfare is really about submitting to God. And once we are in submission, we can personalize these Bible verses. And we can be victorious in any temptation we are faced with. Maybe we can have a last word and then uh, we'll close. Let me just read one more punchline and then we can finish. Um, let's read Deuteronomy 31 verse 8. Maybe Elsie can read it as we close. Okay, and it says that the Lord himself goes before you and he will be with you. He will never leave you nor will he forsake you. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. Amen. What a promise from our Lord. And may the Lord bless you all. Let's pray. Our Father and our God, we come before you once again. And we thank you for the lesson we have learned today from your servant David. That if we believe in you, we can slay the giants of our lives. Lord, may these words be power over sin for those who will tune in to watch our brief study of this story. May the lessons we have taught others be manifest in our own lives. And may they give us grace to overcome the giants that we face. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.